And we're live. Welcome, everybody. This is the pre-show for Tuesday Night Talks special edition, which will feature Rebecca Belmore. Uh, good evening. And this is your opportunity to check your audio and your video while settling in for the next 45 to 50 minutes of riveting conversation. Uh, COVID is still upon us here in British Columbia with over 900 cases today. Here at the O'Dane Art Museum, we're taking every precaution to keep our staff and visitors safe. This includes the soft opening of Rebecca Belmore's exhibition entitled Reservoir uh, that opens this Thursday, November 26th. And the museum remains open Thursday to Sunday, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. So just a little special feature during the pre-show. We've got a few things that you can buy online via our shop, which you can reach at shop.odaneartmuseum.com. First and foremost, thank you, Nadine. We have this brilliant book, uh, which is called Wordless, the performance art of Rebecca Belmore. And this is a book that was published uh, last year by the Grunt Gallery with an investment from the O'Dane Art Museum, as well as the Canada Council for the Arts. It's a series of essays that examines uh, the full arc of Rebecca Belmore's practice over the past 30 years. There you go, Nadine. In addition, uh, because we are so COVID friendly, we're also selling online masks. And this one features a brilliant work from our collection by Emily Carr called La, La Paysage. So again, these are all available on our shop. And from November 26th to December 3rd, free shipping for all your uh, gift needs this holiday season. Okay, so the pre-show is gonna wind up. So tune in and get comfortable. Maybe get a glass of water or other beverage of choice. And Justine is telling me to stretch it out a little bit. The snow has arrived here in Whistler, British Columbia, and it's almost 8 p.m. And we've got more snow this week as temperatures go down. But as you know, uh, we're in a bit of a delayed circumstance here with COVID and restrictions uh, throughout the Vancouver coastal corridor. But eventually we can all ski and snowboard and cross country ski and all those wonderful winter things you can do. Okay, now we're gonna go right to the top of the broadcast. So welcome everybody and thank you for tuning in to this special edition of the Tuesday Night Talks, otherwise known as TNT. As during the first season of TNT this past spring and summer, it's happening in the midst of the COVID pandemic. And here in BC, we've got enhanced precautions in place until December 7th. And unfortunately, worldwide deaths from COVID have reached 1.4 million. Tonight, I'm here in the Tom and Teresa Gotro Gallery for a special exhibition here at the O'Dane Art Museum, and it's by Rebecca Belmore, entitled Reservoir. Uh, this broadcast is being sponsored by Denton's, the international law firm with a office in Vancouver. And I want to acknowledge that we're on the shared uh, traditional territories of the Squamish and Lillooet nations. Reservoir will be on display here at the museum from November 26th to May 16th. Tonight, we've reached a TNT record in that we've had 350 people registered and uh, all across Canada and around the world. And we're going to uh, talk uh, with Rebecca tonight about some recent works, as well as a few site-based creations that were made specifically for this exhibition. And after we work, move through a few pieces, there'll be an opportunity for a question and answer period. We've had some advanced questions and you can also 
uh, type in your questions and send them during the course of this broadcast and we'll fit in as many as possible within the time limitation that we have. So live from her kitchen in Toronto, Ontario at Dufferin College, where it's just after 11 p.m., Rebecca Belmore. Good evening, Rebecca. Good evening, Curtis. How are you? So pleased. I'm doing great. <laughs> so happy to be here. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, fun, no? <laughs> Let's have fun. <laughs> Let's have fun. And that's a beautiful star blanket behind you, Rebecca. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> It was a gift uh, uh, for my AGO exhibition in 2018, and I received it from uh, Wanda Nanabush and uh, Robert Hool and uh, others. So that was, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to have it here tonight. You look wonderful behind you. Okay, so um, I think what we'll do is that we'll launch right into uh, the works here in the exhibition, and we'll start with the piece located just behind me entitled body of water and this was commissioned uh, by the Istanbul Biennale uh, which was themed the seventh continent uh, by curator Nicholas Borido. Um and the first image that we'll bring up Rebecca is the preliminary uh, studio work that you did in preparation for the creation of this piece so we'll bring up that first slide Justine. Yes thank you thank you very much uh, this work, um, I started making it, I guess, um, uh, I started thinking about it while I was in Vancouver last year. And I was staying in um, the Mount Pleasant uh, neighborhood and living like on the third floor of this apartment building. And when I looked uh, down, you know, when I looked out the window and down towards the ground, I would see this canoe, which was covered in this blue, beautiful, worn blue tarp. So I became kind of uh, obsessed with, you know, going to the window and, and looking down at this, this body. Because I think from the third floor, it's, it resembled a, a marine mammal to me. Next Brilliant. Slide. And that idea of seventh continent, can you talk a little bit about that, Rebecca, in terms of setting the context for this piece? Well, uh, the seventh continent is a is essentially, uh, I guess, a wasteland of, uh, of plastic garbage, like a mass of plastic garbage, which is floating out <coughs> in, in the ocean. Um, and so, and it's somewhere, I guess, in the, you know, somewhere around India, Southeast Asia, so in that area. And I think it's, it's mostly comprised of plastic. And so I think, I think uh, what the curator was, what I thought he was asking was for artists to think about, um, you know, what we humans have done to the planet, to this, you know, to not only the planet, but to all living things on this planet. So I was, you know, I was just really, uh, I was really uh, taken with this theme. And as I was looking out the window, you know, in my, our apartment in Vancouver, I, looking down at this canoe that reminded me of a marine mammal, I thought of all the, uh, you know, all those living uh, creatures, uh, all that life in the ocean that is, I think, being threatened today. Okay, let's go to the install shot in Istanbul, and perhaps you can begin to discuss, you know, how it was installed there and, and how it was received. Okay. Um, I have to start by I have to start by saying this is a little odd for me to be talking to my laptop, <laughs> but um, <laughs> the world uh, right now, and uh, I guess I'm trying to come to terms with it myself. And, you know, when I look beyond uh, this image of, of the body of water installed in Istanbul, I'm looking at the dirty dishes in my sink. So, but I think it's all related in some way because it all is connected by water. So. I think, you know, how, I guess my, my interest in looking at uh, water and uh, this idea of our bodies being water and, you know, in, in naming this work uh, Body of Water, I was really thinking about how life is, um, uh, is nothing without water. 
or water is essential to life. And I think we all know that, we really do. Next slide. Excellent. And, and uh, at the close of the Istanbul uh, BNL, it's somewhat ironic that this 2,900 pound uh, cast aluminum piece was put on a boat and came across, I'm assuming the Atlantic Ocean uh, to just outside of Montreal. And um, it revisited a foundry and perhaps you can discuss what happened then. Yes, um, the piece was, uh, was fabricated in, in Istanbul at a, an, a large, very large uh, aluminum factory. And um, it was really in my, you know, I wasn't quite happy with how it came out at, the, at that time. So I kind of uh, dealt with it, I guess you call it, you know, we call it, uh, this is part of the process. And so when it was shipped back to Montreal, it went to uh, Inverness, to a foundry where they uh, took on this very uh, labor intensive, arduous task of polishing the canoe to this kind of uh, mirror finish. And for me, you know, I was interested in, you know, really um, addressing this idea of this sculpture, this object being uh, a body of water. Maybe we'll look at the next slide. Beautiful. And so you can see here in this picture that um, this is, as you said, you know, almost 2,900 pounds. Uh, so it's, it is a beast, you know, and I speak of it that way when it has to be, I guess, transported and put into a, a very nice, pleasant setting, like where you're sitting right now, Curtis. You know, it's put into this uh, serene space. When, when you think about it and you look at it in this image on its side, you know, it, it, ha it has gone through this, you know, very long process of coming into being and coming to Whistler. Maybe we can look at the next slide. Okay. Can you hear me? I hope yes, you can. very well. And we were fortunate uh, with Pierre André at uh, the foundry in Inverness was really kind enough to make the shipping arrangements and here we see it on a flatbed truck on its way from Quebec across the country to British Columbia. Yes, uh, I remember I sent this picture to my older siblings in Thunder Bay and my older sister Sally made a joke that she, she said, when do you think it will go by? I'll drive out to the highway to see if I can see it. So I thought that was quite humorous. This, and I think it was her take on this idea that this, you know, this piece of you know, cast aluminum, which was created in Istanbul, came by ship to Montreal and then was you know, on this very truck and driving past Thunder Bay and actually past Uppsala, Ontario, which is where I was born. So I think it's actually quite bizarre and, and lovely too. Excellent. And I can attest to the fact that uh, when it arrived here in, in Whistler, uh, it was quite a task to get off the truck into our loading dock, into our elevator upstairs, where we unboxed it. And we have uh, a few shots of that whole process that we can walk through with you. Here it is, um, just as we were taking apart the crate. Yes, and actually it was interesting. Uh, when it was coming out of the box, uh, we could all see that it had like um, condensation on its surface, you know, because it was out in the cold and then coming into the, the warmth of the, and the safety of, you know, the gallery space. So yeah, it's quite- Yes, I, I, it was quite, quite an undertaking. Yes. And uh, part of the process was to uh, move it out of that box using two engine lifts and we'll go to that shot now and maybe you want to just talk about the process and the thought behind how you've positioned it here in the Tom and Teresa Gocho Gallery. Um, uh, when it was, when it was um, uh, shown in Istanbul, I wasn't you know, terribly pleased with how it was placed because of its weight it had to go kind of in a lobby space um, in this one of the venues of the BNL, but nonetheless, it was there. And for me, I think I'm, you know, I'm really uh, pleased that it's here in this space 
because it's a it's quite a large gallery, and I was you know really happy to uh, have it situated in a room by itself. So it has this you know breathing space that has room to you know to float and to uh, have this kind of uh, movement within its um, within its form. And I think the the, yeah. the gallery gives it that. Yeah. Yes, in fact, um, it's positioned here in, in the largest of the three uh, uh, special exhibition galleries, and it, it really occupies this space well. It's not dead center. It sort of leans in one direction. And uh, we'll move on to just the shots here in the gallery. And perhaps you can also talk to Rebecca, the LED lighting system that gives it that effect of floating on the floor. Yeah, um, that was my, um, my idea from the beginning of, you know, coming up with this work, is that I wanted the piece to um, carry some kind of energy or some kind of life force, you know, because it's, you know, it is a, a static object, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a whole huge process in making it. And it's you know it's static, but at the same time, I think with the light here, like with the light that comes from within the body, um, it has uh, uh, I guess a, a lightness to to the its presence. I think that's that's what I was striving for with this idea of, an, of lighting it from within. So that's and here a, we have an overhead view, and and I think it'll give our our viewers a, a better idea of really how it it seems to float on the floor and again with this this light that leaks out the bottom uh, in terms of how you wanted it lit here Rebecca and, and the positioning can you speak to that a little more um, well I think um, if you go through you know when people come up to Whistler to visit the exhibition if we start in the beginning of the exhibition and as we move through the, the gallery spaces, you land in this space. Uh, it's kind of the finale, it's the finish of the exhibition, in my thinking. And so the room is quite um, dimly, it's dimly lit. And so this, um, this creature, this body of water uh, has its own kind of uh, mystery. It has, it, it carries some kind of, um, I don't know what, I, for lack of a better word, you know, for me, it carries some kind of um, energy or, you know, I, I, or spirit. I, I'll go for that far and say that. It, <laughs> it's a, yeah. Spirit is a, and you had mentioned to, to me in one discussion that, you know, from this perspective, you know, it looks like the part of a whale when you see them breaching the water a little bit. Is, is that intentional or just a happy consequence? Well, no, that, that goes back to my, my, the beginning, my story of looking down from the third floor at this, you know, canoe that someone had stored, you know, on the ground and had covered, draped it with this tarp. So to me, it looked like a, like a marine mammal kind of coming. Okay. okay, now we'll move to the last image where we're looking uh, at a different perspective. And anything you'd like to wrap up on the discussion of this piece before we move to the next series of work? Um, I think we've covered everything I want to say about it. Um, I really, but I think this image and it illustrates the floating quality that I was after, for sure. Great. So uh, the second room in the exhibition has a, a very unique quality to it in that it features a series of performance photographs and we'll move to that slide now. And these performance photographs are also accompanied by a series of stills of the performances that uh, inspired these photographs. All the photographs are from uh, 2017 and, and were shot by Henri Rabideau. Um, and what we'll do now, Rebecca, is that we'll cycle through uh, just a still from each of the performances and then we'll move on to the performance uh, photograph. So we'll begin with the performance that was entitled 
uh, vigil, and maybe you can offer some background on that performance. Uh, yes, I, that, that performance took place in 2002 in the downtown east side of Vancouver, at the, near the corner of Cordova and Gore Street, outside the Fire Hall Theater. And so that year, of course, um, Robert Picton had been uh, finally brought to uh, justice, or he, he was at least uh, formally charged for the murder, the, yeah, the many, many murders of, of women, many of who, who lived or um, you know, were in this neighborhood. Um, so I think in 2002, I, was, I had just come back from um, uh, Trinidad and I arrived in Vancouver and I knew I had to make this performance and my husband Osvaldo and my sister Lorraine helped me um, gather you know, my wits about me and, and really um, work towards helping me uh, put my idea um, together. And so essentially in, in this performance, the major, I guess, um, uh, object, or if you want to say prop, was this red dress. Um, and so I, I was nailing this dress into the telephone pole and, and then freeing myself uh, from, this, uh, from this garment. And so if you look at the next slide, uh, the next slide. Here uh, in 2017, you know, I was able to, uh, with the, you know, through this, uh, uh, through Grunt Gallery and the funding and whatnot uh, and the partners, I was able to um, re rework this idea and, or, or maybe in this particular photograph, maybe uh, depict it in some way, although I've removed myself and I've inserted my sister Florine as the um, person in, in this artwork. And also I noticed both in the actual the performance and this performance photograph, you have names written on your arms and, and in this case Florine's arms. Yes. Um, at that time, of course, there was a list of uh, missing and murdered women in, in that, from that vicinity, from, you know, from the city of Vancouver, or, or I don't exactly remember how, how far it stretched, but it, it was, so I, what I did is I took this list and I put the first name of, of um, um, these women on my arms. And so in the performance, you would see me raising my arm and reading the name and then yelling it, you know, screaming it into the, into the space, onto the street. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to the next uh, black and white. And this is a piece uh, entitled Clay on Stone uh, that was in the Walker Court at the Art Gallery of Ontario. It was, a, as I believe, a dusk to dawn performance. Can you elaborate on that performance, please? Yes, so uh, this took place, as you said, in, in Walker Court at the AGO, and it was part of uh, Nuit Blanche, and it was part of uh, a series of performances uh, that the AGO was organizing kind of in at the same time. And so the piece is titled Clay on Stone, and um, you see, I think, it, you know, if, if you were to look at many of my performances, you will see that I carry certain objects and materials um, forward. And so here I have this black bucket, which actually comes from, um, I came, I, I, we purchased them in 2005 when we were in Venice. And so I like this idea of these buckets were used, they're basically, um, you know, for some kind of work uh, they're work buckets, you know, so I, I, I like the fact that I still have them and I still reuse them. So I carry these buckets and I've had other buckets. So I'm kind of a bucket obsessed. And then also um, I, ha I have this love of these very simple gestures, which I would say that as a child, I remember, uh, you know, our mother on our hands and knees washing 
the floor cleaning the house, you know, doing chores. And so I, I really um, have this connection to, I guess I, I like to get on my hands and knees and wash my own floors. Um, so I, I really think it's, um, you know, the use of a pail, the use of water, the use of, in this case, uh, earth, and to, to kind of um, work at, in this, in this performance piece, to work at by hand with my buckets of clay. I work to cover like the Walker Court floor, which is made of stone. And so the stone, you know, in, in the context of this piece of architecture, the, the museum, the art gallery, this stone is considered precious. And so my idea was just to, uh, you know, work sometimes, you know, aggressively, sometimes lovingly, sometimes exhausted, uh, work to put clay on stone, which I think has been done for you know, eons by the human hand. And, and the words uh, that you can see partially in this shot, can you make mention of those, please? The words, I, I don't remember. I might have, I might have written <laughs> like water, earth, and breath. So this idea of the elements, you know, like we as humans, we are, we are water, we need the earth and we breathe the air. Very, very simple ideas. And okay, done. and then the performance photograph. Yes, this was at um, a great space that we had in um, Vancouver, in Mount Pleasant again. And the floor in the space was, had this incredible linoleum which is very earthy looking. And I was really taken with how it kind of uh, was, was very similar to the clay that I had worked with, you know, in clay on stone. And so here again is fluorine, um, you know, washing the earth onto the floor uh, instead of like removing it from the floor. So it's this idea of, you know, for me it's, this piece is titled um, Keeper. And so this idea that this woman is returning the land or uh, taking care of it. It's a very simple. Okay. Piece. And now we'll move on to the final performance shot that we'll discuss. And this was at the Rame Modern in Saskatoon. Uh, and it rendered in ice, uh, etched in the word stone child. Perhaps you can talk yes. to the, the basis of this work. Uh, Neil Stonechild, uh, you know, I'm sure everyone knows who he is. He was a young, uh, young man. He was a 17 year old, he was a teenager. And he was dropped off outside the, uh, you know, at the outskirts of the city on a cold winter night and he was expected to find his way home. And of course, what happened is he never made it home and he was found frozen to death and he was missing one shoe. And there were marks on his wrists that were most likely made by handcuffs. So his, he was dropped off by the police to die. And so uh, my husband and I, Oswaldo, uh, we made this work um, back in the day for like Nuit Blanche in Toronto. And here in, in this situation, it's uh, pictured outside the Ramai, uh, maybe a few years ago, or maybe less. <laughs> Time is like compressed for me these days. But anyways, um, yeah, you can, see how, you can see how deadly cold it is. And we all know how cold it can be in the prairies. And the subsequent um, performance photograph entitled Mother of 217, uh, again, discuss the relationship to the original piece and, and how you pushed it forward. The original piece was made with um, these blocks of ice, which are very clear, they're crystal clear. 
They were quite beautiful. And for the original piece, um, for the original piece, we used the same type of block. So there are commercial, uh, commercial businesses that create this kind of material, usually for uh, weddings and kind of events and whatnot. So we, with uh, Freeze, um, the original work, we, we purchased like, I can't remember, like I think we had 20 of them. So here we have just two that I purchased locally in Vancouver. And in the studio uh, in Mount Pleasant, we, you know, we just have this silvery gray tarp, which kind of has like a wintry kind of quality uh, in its visual, you know, it's visually. And then the ice, I think, um, kind of it recalls freeze, but here is a female figure and she's peering through the ice. And so I was just thinking about how uh, Neil Stonechild's mother, you know, and this thing about mothers and, you know, Neil Stonechild wasn't the only person who <clears throat> died in this way or suffered in this way. So, you know, like people who suffer tragic uh, deaths and uh, always there's, there's a family. And so I just think about I think about my own family and uh, I'm sure, you know, we can all relate to how a mother would feel about this, um, the death, this, this kind of horrible death. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Rebecca. And we'll move now to um, a piece that you created for the first gallery in our, in our special exhibition gallery. And I think it, it, it's a nice, relationship to some of the other works in the gallery and, and it's rooted in these coveralls that have these safety X's on them and uh, you'll see a picture of the both of us uh, during the preparatory period and I can uh, definitely say that this uh, work called Force of Labor was very uh, labor intensive for both you and uh, your sister Florine and we'll move to just a couple of the of the installation shots now. Yeah, I I, um, I have to uh, take a moment here and thank my sister Florine Belmore for her incredible dedication and her hard work. And I truly appreciate, you know, having <laughs> I truly appreciate having her help. Amazing, she's amazing. Anyways, so here we are. Here's my amazing sister. <laughs> in the red t-shirt and there's me kind of looking cross-eyed at the X. So <laughs> that caught us here in a funny moment. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, you know, because, of, because of, I was working with you, Curtis, at the museum and uh, the spaces were much bigger than I had remembered. And so when I was in this gallery space and looking at, you know, looking at the video, that was in the piece, like in this room, alongside this new piece that I wanted to make. I, I thought it had to be in some way uh, monumental in scale, and then also monumental uh, in with its meaning. And so Florine and I, like maybe I had been there a week at the museum already, and then we went back to town and we went to uh, this uh, liquidator kind of business that sells tools and whatnot, like safety gear. And to my surprise and to my like, woo, like, woo, you know, like I, we came across, we went like down these aisles and we came across this mound of used, like really well used, some of them, these coveralls. And my fascination with, um, I guess, the X, you know, is connected to, you know, my knowing that um, my ancestors uh, signed treaties with exes, maybe accompanied by a drawing of a, of a totem, totem. And so that's the, in the first place, the ex for me, that's how I relate to it. But at the same time, you know, I, when I was living in Winnipeg in I guess it was 2012, I went to the town of Sudbury 
to make a video piece, which is called titled Perimeter, and it's in this exhibition in the same space as this uh, new piece. And in the video, um, it's myself uh, walking through, you know, the landscape of the surround the area surrounding the city of uh, Sudbury, you know, from the <coughs> First Nations community to the town to um, the restricted property of the of the mining companies, and so for me, uh, this coverall um, signifies uh, the labor the labor that goes into. If you look, if you really when you drive around the city, you can if you really notice, you will start. You know, if you really look, you'll start to notice these uniforms. And so for me, it's it's really. Um, I know it's 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 connected to my own you know my own understanding or my, maybe my own upbringing you know in northwestern Ontario where people work in the logging industry there's all kinds of labor you know on this land and in this country and all over the world so I, and then in this work um, maybe you should cut in there Curtis <laughs> I need help. <laughs> Okay, well, one very particular feature of this work is it's, it's lined with a gold vinyl behind and in our discussions you had mentioned that, you know, the, the workers that work in these mines never achieve the wealth of the people that own these mines and the major corporations. Yes. Do you want to speak to that effect a little? Yes, I think I think you know I was starting with the X, you know the X, like the treaty X, the signature, um, and then the laborer, and then also myself, the artist, you know, the X on my back, and even I guess myself as a laborer, and then this whole idea of you know um, commodity. Uh, resources, you know, it's all, it's all tied together. It's all very complicated. And I think that, um, you know, I think my experience in Sudbury was very profound in the sense that um, I got to spend time and, and just walk, you know, just to traverse this terrain and, and to, you know, and to know and to feel how very charged it is. And so I think, you know, in this work, force of labor and this idea of labor and, and wealth and unattainable wealth as well, I think it has a lot to do with you know, how, how we all, you know, we all work and we make, you know, as an artist, I work, I make work and then I try to make a living too. And, you know, so I think it's really, it's really complicated. <laughs> okay, so the last uh, two pieces that we'll discuss, one, March 5th, 1819, it's uh, an older work, a two-channel video from 2008 uh, that we're representing here at the O'Dane Art Museum. And perhaps you can just set this up a little bit in terms of how it led to another new work that you created for uh, this exhibition entitled Reservoir. Curtis? Curtis? <coughs> Curtis? Yeah. Can we yes. go back to the last slide? Just, I just want to... Oh, thank I just, you. I just want to spend a moment to, to have allow people to look at peace in its full capacity. And in the space, the work is installed um, at, at six feet and then up. And so for me, that's also important that as a viewer, you, you look up at this piece. So, you know, hence my effort to, to kind of create some kind of strange, maybe uh, anti-monument, perhaps, I don't know. Okay, we can go on to the next one. Okay, sorry for jumping ahead there. So as I said, uh, this piece, March 5th, 1819, the two channel video from 2008 is being presented here. And can you give us just a little background on this piece? Uh, this was made in 2008. And I went to uh, Newfoundland 
into St. John's with Glenn Altine. And he was the curator for my project. And we, <laughs> during our visit, we went like for a pre-visit and we actually went to Red Indian Lake, which is where um, the capture of Mary March, was Mary March, but her, her name is uh, Damastowit. She was a Beartuck woman who was captured on March 5th, 1819. And so I, this was shot actually um, in the mountains here in, outside of Vancouver, but I was having a conversation with someone around the time of this making. And he said, well, Rebecca, think about it. Like perhaps, you know, like long ago, back in 1819, there were very large trees on, the, on that coast. So I found, I found that very interesting. Um, so with this work, I was interested in this idea that, or in this, this historic moment, this historic day when Mary March, or her real name, Demastowit, was captured at Red Indian Lake. And during this capture, her husband, who was trying to save her, was killed. He was killed by settlers who had, of course, who had come to take uh, what they were calling Red Indians at that time. And so in this work, um, I was interested in looking at this couple, this woman and this man who, you know, were alive in 1819 and how uh, this tragic event ended their uh, their relationship and what I think of is it ended their love for each other. So, uh, and in, in this video, I dress uh, the two actors in contemporary clothes, clothing, so that the, my hope is that the viewer will uh, think about, uh, you know, only 200 years ago, the story took place. And if you think about Neil Stonechild, you know, that story took place as well. So all this kind of violence is happening, um, you know, on this land with you know, indigenous peoples. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then the um, final piece that we'll talk about in this exhibition is one entitled Hereafter. And again, you you revisit those coveralls and the X on the vest. And uh, it's your sister looking out over the ocean in this three uh, panel work. I'm exhausted. <laughs> Hang in there, Rebecca, it's only a few more minutes. <laughs> How did you come up with that idea? And I'm reliving all the, you know, all the things that are part of me and um, make me do what I what I do, and so here, this piece is titled um, "Hereafter," and um, uh, it was made just like a few weeks ago. And I I came to, like I think I came to Whistler like maybe three weeks, maybe four weeks, three and a half weeks, four weeks. I can't remember, but I came to <laughs> I came to Vancouver and and you know I had this huge beautiful space, you know, to work with. And then of course, um, I had a conversation with Cur you, Curtis, where I was like, are you okay with like, if we put, you know, not very many things in this, in this, you know, space that I have uh, access to. And so uh, hereafter was, was really, um, you know, there's something that was canceled due to COVID, which was a performance that uh, Florine and uh, Donald Moran, who's, who's in the March 5th, who's the actor in the March 5th, 1819 piece. We were going to work together and make a new performance work. And we were going to wear uh, the X and the coverall. And so uh, that didn't happen, but I still think that this work um, in some way, uh, in some way um, alludes to or captures some uh, some part of what, what I was trying to get at. And what I was trying to get at is that, I'm just going back to this idea of 
water being uh, essential to all, to all things. And then how we know that um, water is being compromised and, and um, here in this, you know, this triptych, the figure, you don't have to know that it's fluorine. This figure is looking, you know, is standing in the water and looking up and out. And I was thinking about, you know, being here, you know, here on the West Coast, and not that it has to be the West Coast, but if you think about its proximity to March 5th, just in the other room, and then here on the West Coast, um, this woman or this person is looking, uh, I think, to the future of maybe, is it about uh, seeking or certain um, water? So, and that goes back to the title of the exhibition, like Reservoir. So it all, you know, it all ties up into something. <laughs> okay. Well, you're hanging in there, Rebecca, and I really appreciate the length of your discussion. Uh, we're gonna just move to two questions. Uh, and this is the original shot by Henri Rabideau, Rabideau sorry, uh, that also did the performance photographs. So to give our viewers a, a sense of the original piece and, and then how it got transferred to those panels. So we're gonna wind up uh, with the Q&A part and we'll just have two questions. And the first one is actually a very similar question that came from both Wanda and Jessica in Toronto. And essentially they wanted to know, you know, how you perceive this work body of water behind me as different when it appeared in Istanbul, which as you know, is a large metropolis surrounded by water versus its appearance here in Whistler, uh, a small resort town in the mountains. Well, I think uh, some of us, we live in the museum sphere and the gallery sphere. So I think sometimes, you know, not all works are site specific. And I think, um, but at the same time, to go back to, you know, the beginning of my chatter, um, my talking by myself in my kitchen, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I was thinking about, you know, to go back to looking out the window and seeing this, this beautiful, you know, pod shaped form down on the ground draped and seeing it from above, you know, that was such a, a beautiful thing. And then wanting to, you know, and then also, you know, I can relate to canoes, like canoes are part of, you know, my history, my indigenous history and my Anishinaabe history. So I can really, you know, I connect with this, with this form, but at the same time the, that it takes on this kind of, uh, this character or this essence of, of being alive, of being uh, a water be being, of being a body of water. So uh, it's really, I don't think it has to, I don't think it has to be in one place. So I don't know if I'm answering the question, but yeah, that's my answer. Okay. And actually we have a, an excellent question to wind up this whole session. And it comes from Glenn in Vancouver. Um, and he asks, performance has always been at the core of your practice, but more recently your work has moved into installation and photography to sculpture and large public art pieces. However, you're still focused on the body, both your own and others. I was wondering if you could talk about the body relationship to your practice. Well, I think I've been making uh, installation for quite a while as well as you know, uh, performance works and sculpture uh, too. But to answer like Glenn's question, um, what was it? Sorry. <laughs> the relationship your your body to your practice and how that's an on, ongoing effort through many media. Well, I, I think it it really boils down to that my body is is my own, <laughs> and my body is um, Anishinaabe. It's a woman. It's female. Um, it comes from a very particular. Uh, place. It comes from a very particular um, 
history. And so I think with performance, I'm able to <coughs> pursue and, and go forward with thinking about um, what's going on in the world. And, and then of course it's coming from my, you know, my artist body. So that's how, that's how I've learned how to think of this idea of working uh, and this that idea of working as a performance artist and as a maker of, of things. Um, and I think that we have always used our bodies. And I think the body speaks, you know, bodies speak to each other. And, you know, and now, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with speaking through this medium of, you know, and using uh, the internet or technology. And so I think bodies relating to other bodies is really essential to, I think, our well being and our humanity. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca. And we really appreciate your time here tonight. Uh, we have just a, a few thank yous to go through as, as we wind up this special edition of TNT. Uh, both Rebecca and myself want to thank the entire team here at the O'Dane Art Museum for working so hard and so diligently over the past three weeks uh, to make this show the success that is it, it is. Um, I also want to express my respect and appreciation for the ongoing support of Michael O'Dane and Yoshi Karasawa, in addition to the expert guidance that we receive here uh, from the O'Dane Art Museum trustees, as well as the support of our founders. Uh, our TNT crew tonight um, are always creative and diligent. Our director producer, Justine Nickel, our quality control coordinator, Nadine Hassan, and both Rebecca and I have a, a few shout outs that we'd like to uh, put out over this disembodied media. Uh, one to my father in Cornwall, my little sister in Canada, uh, a mutual friend of both Rebecca and I, Robert Houle in Toronto. Uh, and for the sake of embarrassment, hi Florine in Vancouver, as well as Glenn in Vancouver and the Beacom family on the farm in uh, Southwestern Ontario. And lastly, but certainly not least, uh, Rebecca wants to express her appreciation to Oswaldo. Thank you as well as my pro earbud falls out to Denton who has sponsored this entire evening. And I wanna thank the viewers here uh, of TNT that you've made this virtual endeavor a great success. Uh, and mostly Rebecca, I wanna say thanks to you. Thank you. It's just been a wonderful pleasure working with you over the past few weeks. And I really appreciate, you know, your steadfast commitment to uh, being an art activist and, and pursuing social justice through your practice. Um, so thanks Rebecca and I appreciate you staying up late and wanna say good night. Good night. <laughs>